believe this is possible is to believe you can do it. This can only be the voice of the ego. Truth can only be recognized and need only be recognized. Inspiration is of the spirit and certainty is of God according to his laws. Both, therefore, come from the same source, since inspiration comes from the voice for God and certainly comes from the laws of God. Healing does not come directly from God, who knows his creations as perfectly whole. Yet healing is still of God because it proceeds from his voice and from his laws. It is their result in a state of mind which does not know him. The state is unknown to him and therefore does not exist. But those who sleep are stupefied or better, unaware. Because they are unaware, they do not know. The Holy Spirit must work through you to teach you he is in you. This is an intermediate step toward the knowledge that you are in God because you are part of him. The miracles which the Holy Spirit inspires can have no order of difficulty because every part of creation is of one order. This is God's will and yours. The laws of God establishes this, and the Holy Spirit reminds you of it. When you heal, you are remembering the laws of God and forgetting the laws of the ego. We said before that forgetting is merely a way of remembering better. It is therefore not the opposite of remembering when it is properly perceived. Perceived improperly, it induces a perception of conflict with something else, as all incorrect perception does. Properly perceived, it can be used as a way out of conflict, as all proper perception can. All abilities, then, should be given over to the Holy Spirit, who knows him how to use them properly. He can use them only for healing, because he knows you only as whole. By healing, you learn of wholeness, and by learning of wholeness, you learn to remember God. You have forgotten him, but the Holy Spirit still knows that your forgetting must be translated into a way of remembering and not perceived as a separate ability which opposes an opposite. That is the way in which the ego tries to use all abilities, and since its goal is always to make you believe that you are in opposition. The ego's goal is as unified as the Holy Spirit's, and it is because of this that their goals can never be reconciled in any way or to any extent. The ego always seeks to divide and separate. The Holy Spirit always seeks to unify and heal. As you heal, you are healed, because the Holy Spirit sees no order of healing. Healing is the way to undo the belief in differences, being the only way of perceiving the sonship without this belief. This perception is therefore in accord with the laws of God, even in the state of mind which is out of accord with his. The strength of right perception is so great that it brings the mind into accord with his because it yields to his pull, which is in all of you. To oppose the pull of the, or the will of God is not an ability but a real delusion. The ego believes that it has this ability and can offer it to you as a gift. You do not want it. It is not a gift. It is nothing at all. God has given you a gift which you both have and are. When you do not use it, you do not know you have it. By not knowing this, you do not know what you are. Healing, then, is a way of approaching knowledge by thinking in accordance with the laws of God and recognizing their universality. Without this recognition, you have made the laws themselves meaningless to you. Yet the laws are not meaningless, since all meaning is contained by them and in them. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, because that is where the laws of God operate truly, and they can operate only truly, since they are the laws of truth. But seek this only, because you can find nothing else. There is nothing else. God is all in all in a very literal sense. All being is in him who is all being. You are therefore in him since your being is his. Healing is a way of forgetting the sense of danger the ego has induced in you by not recognizing its existence in your brothers. This strengthens the Holy Spirit in both of you because it is a refusal to acknowledge fear. Love needs only this invitation. It comes freely to all the sonship being what the sonship is. By your awakening to it, you are merely forgetting what you are not. This enables you to remember what you are, healing and the changelessness of mind. The body is nothing more than a framework for developing abilities. It is therefore a means for developing potentials, which is quite apart from what the potential is used for. That is a decision. The effects of the ego's decision in this matter are so apparent that they need no elaboration here, but the Holy Spirit's decision to use the body only for communication has such a direct connection with healing that it does need clarification. The unhealed healer obviously does not understand his own vocation. 
Only minds communicate. Since the ego cannot obliterate the impulse to communicate because it also the impulse to create, the ego can only teach you that the body can both communicate and create and therefore does not need the mind. The ego thus tries to teach you that the body can act like the mind and is therefore self-sufficient. Yet we have learned that behavior is not the level for either teaching or learning. This must be so since you can act in accordance with what you do not believe. To do this, however, will weaken you as teachers and learners because, as has been repeatedly emphasized, you teach what you do believe. An inconsistent lesson will be poorly taught and poorly learned. If you teach both sickness and healing, you are both a poor teacher and a poor learner. Healing is the one ability which everyone can develop and must develop if he is to be healed. Healing is the Holy Spirit's form of communication and the only one he knows. He recognizes no other because he does not accept the ego's confusion of mind and body. Minds can communicate, but they cannot hurt. The body, in the service of the ego, can hurt other bodies, but this cannot occur unless the body has already been confused with the mind. This fact, too, can be used either for healing or for magic, but you must remember that magic is always the belief that healing is harmful. This is its totally insane premise, and so it proceeds accordingly. Healing only strengthens. Magic always tries to weaken. Healing perceives nothing in the healer that everyone else does not share with him. Magic always sees something special in the healer which he believes he can offer as a gift to someone who does not have it. He may believe that the gift comes from God to him, but it is quite evident that he does not understand God if he thinks he has something that others lack. You might well ask then why some healing can result from this kind of thinking, and there is a reason for this. However misguided the magical healer may be, he is also trying to help. He is conflicted and unstable, but at times he is offering something to the sonship, and the only thing the sonship can accept is healing. When the so-called healing works, then, the impulse to help and to be helped have coincided. This is coincidental because the healer may may not be experiencing himself as truly helpful at the time, but the belief that he is in the mind of another helps him. The Holy Spirit does not work by chance, and healing that is of him always works. Unless the healer always heals by him, the results will vary. Yet healing itself is consistent, since only consistence is conflict-free, and only the conflict-free are whole. By accepting exceptions and acknowledging that he can sometimes heal and sometimes not, the healer is obviously accepting inconsistency. He is therefore in conflict and teaching conflict. Can anything of God not be for all and for always? Love is incapable of any exceptions. Only if there is fear does the idea of exceptions seem to be meaningful. Exceptions are fearful because they are made by fear. The fearful healer is a contradiction in terms and is therefore a concept which only a conflicted mind could possibly perceive as meaningful. Fear does not gladden. Healing does. Fear always makes exceptions. Healing never does. Fear produces dissociation because it induces separation. Healing always produces harmony because it proceeds from integration. Healing is predictable because it can be counted on. Everything that is of God can be counted on because everything of God is wholly real. Healing can be counted on because it is inspired by his voice and is in accord with his laws. Yet, if healing is consistent, it cannot be inconsistently understood. Understanding means consistence because God means consistence. Since that is his meaning, it is also yours. Your meaning cannot be out of accord with his because your whole meaning and your only meaning comes from his and is like his. God cannot be out of accord with himself and you cannot be out of accord with him. You cannot separate yourself from your creator who created you by sharing his being with you. The unhealed healer wants gratitude from his brothers but he is not grateful to them. This is because he thinks he is giving something to them and is not receiving something equally desirable in return. His teaching is limited because he is learning so little. His healing lesson is limited by his own ingratitude, which is a lesson in sickness. Learning is constant and so vital in its power for change that a son of God can recognize his power in one instant and change the world in the next. That is because by changing his mind, he has changed the most powerful device that was ever created for change. 
This in no way contradicts the changelessness of mind as God created it, but you think that you have changed it as long as you learn through the ego. This does place you in a position of needing to learn a lesson which seems contradictory. You must learn to change your mind about your mind. Only by this can you learn that it is changeless. When you heal, that is exactly what you are learning. You are recognizing the changeless mind in your brother by realizing that he could not have changed his mind. That is how you perceive the Holy Spirit in him. It is only the Holy Spirit in him that never changes his mind. He himself must think he can or he would not perceive himself as sick. He therefore does not know what his self is. If you see only the changeless in him, you have not really changed him at all. By changing your mind about his for him, you help him undo the change his ego thinks it has made in him. As you can hear two voices, so you can see in two ways. One way shows you an image, or better, an idol, which you may worship out of fear, but which you will never love. The other shows you only truth, which you will love because you will understand it. Understanding is appreciation because what you understand you can identify with, and by making it part of you, you have accepted it with love. That is how God himself created you, in understanding, in appreciation, and in love. The ego is totally unable to understand this because it does not understand what it makes. It does not appreciate and does not love it. It incorporates to take away. It literally believes that every time it deprives someone of something, it has increased. We have spoken often of the increase of the kingdom by your creations, which can only be created as you were. The whole glory and perfect joy that is the kingdom lies in you to give. Do you not want to give it? You cannot forget the Father because I am with you, and I cannot forget him. To forget me is to forget yourself and him who created you. Our brothers are forgetful. That is why they need your remembrance of me and him who created me. Through this remembrance, you can change their minds about themselves as I can change yours. Your minds are so powerful and light that you can look into theirs and enlighten them as I can enlighten yours. I do not want to share my body in communion with you because that is to share nothing. Yet I do want to share my mind with you because we are of one mind and that mind is ours. See only this mind everywhere because only this is everywhere and in everything. It is everything because it encompasses all things within itself. Blessed are you who perceive only this because you perceive only what is true. Come therefore unto me and learn of the truth in you. The mind we share is shared by all our brothers, and as we see them truly, they will be healed. Let your mind shine with mine upon their minds, and by our gratitude to them, make them aware of the light in them. This light will shine back upon you and on the whole sonship, because this is your proper gift to God. He will accept it and give it to the sonship, because it is acceptable to him and therefore to his sons. This is the true communion of the Spirit who sees the altar of God in everyone, and by bringing it to your appreciation, calls upon you to love God and his creations. You can appreciate the sonship only as one. This is part of the law of creation and therefore governs all thought, from vigilance to peace. Only you can love can love the sonship only as one. You can perceive it as fragmented. It is impossible, however, for you to see something in part of it that you will not attribute to all of it. That is why attack is never discreet and why attack must be relinquished entirely. If it is not relinquished entirely, it is not relinquished at all. Fear and love are equally reciprocal. They make or create depending on whether the ego or the Holy Spirit begets or inspires them, but they will return to the mind of the thinker and they will affect his total perception. That includes his perception of God, of his creations, and of his own. He will not appreciate any of them if he regards them fearfully. He will appreciate all of them if he regards them with love. The mind that accepts attack cannot love. That is because it believes that it can destroy love and therefore does not understand what love is. If it does not understand what love is, it cannot perceive itself as loving. This loses the awareness of being, induces feelings of unreality, and results in utter confusion. Your own thinking has done this because of its power, but your own thinking can also save you from this because its power is not of your making. Your ability to direct to direct your thinking as you will is part of its power. If you do not believe you can do this, you have denied the power of your thought and thus rendered it powerless in your belief. 
The ingeniousness of the ego to preserve itself is enormous, but it stems from the power of the mind which the ego denies. This means that the ego attacks what is preserving it, and this must be a source of extreme anxiety. That is why the ego never knows what it is doing. It is perfectly logical, but clearly insane. The ego draws upon the one source which is totally inimical to its existence for its existence. Fearful of perceiving the power of this source, it is forced to depreciate it. This threatens its own existence, a state which it finds intolerable. Remaining logically but still insane, the ego resolves this completely insane dilemma in a completely insane way. It does not perceive its existence as threatened by projecting the threat onto you and perceiving your being as non-existent. This ensures its continuance if you side with it by guaranteeing that you will not know your own safety. The ego cannot afford to know anything. Knowledge is total and the ego does not believe in totality. This unbelief is its origin, and while the ego does not love you, it is faithful to its own antecedents, begetting as it was begotten. Mind always reproduces as it was produced. Produced by fear, the ego reproduces fear. This is its allegiance, and this allegiance makes it treacherous to love because you are love. Love is your power, which the ego must deny. It must also deny everything which this power gives you because it gives you everything. No one who has everything wants the ego. Its own maker then does not want it. Rejection is therefore the only decision which the ego could possibly encounter if the mind which made it knew itself. And if it recognized any part of the sonship, it would know itself. The ego therefore opposes all appreciation, all recognition, all same perception and all knowledge. It perceives their threat as total because it senses the fact that all commitments the mind makes are total. Forced then to detach itself from you, who are mind, it is willing to attach itself to anything else, but there is nothing else. It does not follow that the mind cannot make illusions, but it does follow that if it makes illusions, it will believe in them because that is how it made them. The Holy Spirit undoes illusions without attacking them merely because he cannot perceive them at all. They therefore do not exist for him. He resolves the apparent conflict which they engender by perceiving conflict as meaningless. We said before that the Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is, and it is meaningless. The Holy Spirit does not want you to understand conflict. He wants you to realize that because conflict is meaningless, it cannot be understood. We have already said that understanding brings appreciation, appreciation brings love. Nothing else can be understood because nothing else is real and therefore nothing else has meaning. If you will keep in mind what the Holy Spirit offers you, you cannot be vigilant for anything but God and his kingdom. The only reason you find this difficult is because you think there is something else. Belief does, re does not require vigilance unless it is conflicted. If it is, there are conflicting components within it which have engendered a state of war and vigilance therefore has become essential. Vigilance has no place at all in peace. It is necessary against beliefs which are not true and would never have been called upon by the Holy Spirit if you had not believed the untrue. You cannot deny that when you believe something, you have made it true for you. When you believe what God does not know, your thought seems to contradict his, and this makes it appear as if you are attacking him. We have repeatedly emphasized that the ego does believe it can attack God and tries to persuade you that you have done this. If the mind cannot attack, the ego proceeds perfectly logically to the position that you cannot be mind. By not seeing you as you are, it can see itself as it wants to be. Aware of its weakness, the ego wants your allegiance, but not as you really are. The ego therefore wants to engage your mind in its own delusional system, because otherwise the light of your understanding would dispel it. The ego wants no part of truth, because the truth is that the ego is not true. If truth is total, the untrue cannot exist. Commitment to either must be total since they cannot coexist in your minds without splitting them. If they cannot coexist in peace and if you want peace, you must give up the idea of conflict entirely and for all time. While you believe that two totally contradictory thoughts share truth, your need for vigilance is apparent. Your minds are dividing their allegiance between two kingdoms and you are totally committed to neither. Your identification with the kingdom is totally beyond question except by you when you are thinking insanely. What you are 
is not established by your perception and is not influenced by it at all. All perceived problems in identification at any level are not problems of fact. They are problems of understanding since they mean that you believe what you can understand is up to you to decide. The ego believes this totally, being fully committed to it. It is not true. The ego, therefore, is totally committed to untruth, perceiving in total contradiction to the Holy Spirit and to the knowledge of God. You can be perceived with meaning only by the Holy Spirit because your being is the knowledge of God. Any belief that you accept which is apart from this will obscure God's voice in you and will therefore obscure God to you. Unless you perceive his creations truly, you cannot know the Creator, since God and his creations are not separate. The oneness of the Creator and the creation is your wholeness, your sanity and your limitless power. This limitless power is God's gift to you because it is what you are. If you disassociate your mind from it, you are perceiving the most powerful force in the universe as if it were weak because you do not believe you are part of it. Perceive without your part in it, God's creation is perceived as weak and those who see themselves as weak and do attack. The attack must be blind, however, because there is nothing to attack. Therefore they make up images, perceive them as unworthy and attack them for their unworthiness. That is all the world of the ego is, nothing. It has no meaning, it does not exist. Do not try to understand it because if you do, you are believing that it can be understood and is therefore capable of being appreciated and loved. That will justify it and it cannot be justified. You cannot make the meaningless meaningful. This can only be an insane attempt. Allowing insanity to enter your minds means that you have not judged sanity as wholly desirable. If you want something else, you will make something else, because, but because it is something else, it will attack your thought system and divide your allegiance. You cannot create in this divided state, and you must be vigilant against this divided state, because only peace can be extended. Your divided minds are blocking the extension of the kingdom, and its extension is your joy. If you do not extend the kingdom, you are not thinking with your creator and creating as he created. In this depressing state, the Holy Spirit reminds you gently that you are sad because you are not fulfilling your function as co-creators with God and therefore depriving yourselves of joy. This is not God's will, but yours. If your will is out of accord with God's, you are willing without meaning. Yet because God's will is unchangeable, no real conflict of will is possible. This is the Holy Spirit's perfectly consistent teaching. Creation, not separation, is your will because it is God's and nothing that opposes this means anything at all. Being a perfect accomplishment, the sonship can only accomplish perfectly, extending the joy in which it was created and identifying itself with both its creator and its creations, knowing they are one.